We've been speaking for the last few weeks now about what happened in the Bible after Pentecost. We believe there's a change on Pentecost, that the kingdom program did not continue, but a new program began with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul then received a message directly from the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read there in Galatians chapter 1. That message was a, a revelation of who Jesus Christ was on the cross, what he accomplished on that cross. That had never been preached before, and we're going to see that this morning. But we're going to answer this question because today, majority of the churches think there is only one gospel in the Bible. One gospel. Well, how many gospels are there? What does the word gospel mean, folks? Good news. Good news. Glad tidings. So to say that there is only one gospel in the Bible would mean that, oh boy, if we find good news somewhere or another, that's all it is. And whoever he was talking to, that's the only people he was addressing. So any other time you find good news, what are you going to do with that? Well, as you know very well, I'm sure there's more than one gospel. When we start out in the Bible, and let's start out in the Bible, well, Genesis 1, chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now notice he says he created the heaven and the earth. At this particular time, he's talking about a heaven, not heavens, but one heaven and the earth. And for this particular understanding of what that means, we have to go all the way through the Bible to the end of it, to the book of Revelation. And understand that there is a message that has to do with the earth. There's a message that has to do with the uh, heavens. Now, that can apply to the nation of Israel as well as to the church, the body of Christ. Now, what do I mean by that? The nation of Israel's message was on the earth, the physical blessings and so forth, and the kingdom that was to come down from heaven and be set up here on this earth, and he was going to rule and reign over them for a thousand years. Our ruling and reigning with the Lord is going to be in the heavens, not on the earth. So as we go through the Bible, we need to, need to separate those things out. What Paul calls in 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. All the Bible is truth. Everything God said is truth. But if we don't rightly divide it, what do we do? We make it a lie. So let's, let's run some scriptures this morning. You know, I like Bible study. So let's run some scriptures this morning and, and look at some of the times that God did something the other and said it was good. If God says it's good, is that good news? Yeah, sure is. But most people never think about going all the way back to the book of Genesis to find what that is. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 4, And God saw the light, that it was what? Good. And God divided the light from the darkness. So God starts out in the very thing of creation here, of telling somebody something other that's good. Now the question is, who was he telling that to at that time? Who was he telling that to? Well, he was telling it to the angels, because they were the ones that were here. But then he gave the word to Moses to write down in the Bible so that you and I can understand that. But what he did there was good. In verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and to gather together all the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. There's some more good news. The same thing again, who is it for? So you come all the way down to verse 31. Now there is four or five more places in there where he says it's good. But when you get to verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made. Now he puts them all together. He's made all this stuff. He's just detailed each one of those things. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now here's some really good news. And as we study our Bible, we realize that there is good news given to people. And then we realize there's some really good news, great news. 
And you see, as we go all the way through our Bible and look at it and study it, to try to find out about it, we start with the issue first of the earth, and that is God's promise to call out a people to be his people here on the earth. And he deals with them, and we don't have the time to bring every verse because we'd be here two weeks from now, still wouldn't cover them all. But turn over to Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2, and Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 2, and Isaiah chapter 40. And see if you know who he's talking about here, and if this is good news for them. Now remember by this time, the nation of Israel is in existence. They're not in their land. Well, I guess probably at this time right here, they are in their land, but they're getting ready to lose it because they've turned away from the Lord. But in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Now, what, when he says that the Lord's house, the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, what, what is that a reference to? What is that a reference to? The kingdom. The kingdoms, the mountains are, uh, are symbolic of kingdoms, and the Lord is going to set up his house on the top of the mountains, and he's going to be exalted above all the kingdoms of this earth. So that's looking forward to the time of what Isaiah says here is the last days. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Good news is offered. Good news is ahead for the nation of Israel. But, Lord, if you've been looking at your TV here lately and looking at Israel, you haven't seen any good news over there, have you? They're having a hard time with war. But the time is coming when God is going to manifest to them some really wonderful news when he's going to set up his house. He's going to come back. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 says he's going to come back. He's going to be that great stone that's going to roll, roll over all of those mountains, all of those kings, grind them to powder, and set up his kingdom there to rule and reign with the nation of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 40, I think I told you to get that one, didn't I? Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 3. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, and pray thee the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for your God. A prophecy concerning someone that was going to come and to make the way for their king to come. And who was that? Who was going to come and prepare the way for the Lord in the desert? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So when John the Baptist comes, he has, he has some good news. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. What should the nation of Israel by now, if they if they've had uh, Genesis to Isaiah all the way up to their present time in Matthew, what should they have known by now? that the time of the kingdom was at hand. It was time for it to be set up. And so John the Baptist is a man that's come to prepare that way. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And we just read that in Isaiah, didn't we? God had prophesied that he was going to send somebody 
to prepare the way for the king and to get him ready. Who is a man, though, in that passage of Scripture that we, we, so when we read that, we say John the Baptist automatically. But who really was that person at the time when Christ was here on the earth was to come? Was it John the Baptist? Or was John the Baptist a doppelganger? John the Baptist was a doppelganger. He come as somebody else. The Lord said John the Baptist came in the spirit of who? Elijah. Elijah, Elijah was the man that was supposed to come. But we know why now. But at that time they did not know. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, after Christ has died on the cross and he ascended up to heaven, he continues with that good news. Notice that this good news is, is something that the nation of Israel should have been ready for, but did they receive it? What did they have to do to show that they received that good news and they believed? Repent and be baptized for the mission of your sins. That's what they had to do to show that they believed in their king, in their kingdom coming. But they didn't do that. Well, after he dies on the cross, he leaves and goes up to heaven. People are on the day of Pentecost when wonderful things are happening. The Holy Spirit has come, given them the power to do the things that they need to do. And, and, and Peter tells them this. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, and verse 19 through 21. Acts chapter 19, pardon me, Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Peter is speaking here and he says, Repent ye therefore. You see, the message is still continuing all the way during the ministry of Christ, starting with John the Baptist up until the time after he dies and ascends up to heaven. The message is still to the nation of Israel and it's repent, repent. You need to change your mind, Israel, about the things that you're doing and you believe in who your king is and, and his coming. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come, come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Now, I want you to notice that carefully, what Peter is saying. Israel, if you will repent, what will God do? He will send Jesus Christ. Well, where is Jesus Christ at now? Where is Jesus Christ at right now when Peter's telling him this? He's up in heaven at the right hand of God. He's ascended up there, and he's seated at the right hand of God. He's waiting to come back and to set up that kingdom. So the thing that needs to be done for them to get that kingdom, the good news is if you will repent, God will send him back. God will send him back and set up that kingdom. And he tells us clearly, that's not something new. That's something they should have known. In verse 21, he says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, notice, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. From Genesis 1, when God made this world and everything in here and sent the prophets, there's always been this issue of this kingdom, the nation of Israel being his, pink, his people here on this earth, and Jesus Christ being their kingdom. That's always been the thing that prophecy was about and looking forward to that. But they rejected that. You know, of all the gospels in the Bible that are talked about, people talk about, they really kind of all lump them into, into one. That's the reason to say they're one. And it's called the gospel of the kingdom. It's this gospel right here that Peter's preaching, that Jesus preached, that John the Baptist preached. The gospel of the kingdom. That is the best-known gospel in the Bible. If you ask people how many gospels are there and the name gospels, they'll tell you the gospel of the kingdom. Well, that is the best-known. But I can say to you this morning, by the authority of the Word of God, it's the least understood. It is the least understood. Christianity today has taken the gospel of the kingdom and placed it in to a position where the church today, the body of Christ, is looking for that place in that kingdom just like Israel. 
and that they're going to rule and reign with the nation of Israel here on this earth. And it is an earthly kingdom. In fact, most churches actually believe that the kingdom of heaven set upon the earth is heaven. That's heaven. When you talk to people about what are you looking for going to heaven, yeah, I'm, I'm going to heaven and I'll be back here with the Lord to rule and reign on this earth. Well, that's, that is a definition of heaven. That is a gospel of a kingdom. That gospel that was preached to them is a kingdom from heaven coming down to the earth and being set up on this earth for the king to rule and to reign over. Some think that this gospel is the only gospel there is. But you know, when John the Baptist come and he started preaching this good news about the, the, the kingdoms in hand and telling them what they needed to do and what was taking place and so forth, he mentioned three different things as being the comings of Christ and being good news. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, there are three, there are three baptisms mentioned there in one thing. That baptism for the kingdom with water, the baptism with the spirit for the supernatural controlling of the, the heart as they go into the kingdom, and for fire, for judgment. All, there are three listed right there in that one place. They're all gospels, but not very many people ever read those, ever acknowledge them, or ever understand what they are. The real gospel today and the real good news is the one that we know from the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, we want to look at a gospel that's not the gospel of the kingdom. I know many people say, well, they're the same. You put them together. No, they're not. Paul says in his prayer for the Ephesians there in Ephesus, he says in verse 18, Ephesians 6, 18, and 19, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching unto, thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Well, now, why in the world? Christ has already been here. He's been presented to the nation of Israel. The kingdom has been given to that little group of believers. Now, why does Paul have to present some good news? What is it that's good news after that? Everything's been taken care of, supposedly. But the problem is that God had a plan to save some folks and the nation of Israel was supposed to do that through their program but they would not they did not they didn't repent they wouldn't accept the kingdom and so there was no way for all the Gentiles out here you know God is not just going to throw all the world away and keep a handful of people but he's got a gospel he's got a message for you today and I the gospel is a wonderful good news of the word of God to you and I. Paul was praying here that he could make that thing known. He could make his he could open his mouth boldly and make it known everywhere he went. What is that mystery gospel? Well, let's look at some verses again. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Some years ago, we had a booth up at the Webster Flea Market, and we had a big sign up there on it, and we had the gospel on it. And we had several folks come by, and especially these young fired-up preachers, they come by and wanted to straighten us all out and said, you know, you, you can't be saved by that. And we could prove real clearly that, yeah, you could. But, but what is it? What is it about that message of Paul? And can it save us exclusively of the nation of Israel 
and the law. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And I want you to highlight this in your Bible, and I want you to go home and read it and study it until you can quote it and understand what it really means. Notice how Paul says this now. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Paul has already preached to the church over at Corinth. He established that church. And he's writing them back in this letter. And he says, I declare unto you the gospel that I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Verse 2. By which... What is the which there? Is that the gospel he's talking about? Verse 2. Verse 1, read it again. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. What is the which referring to? The gospel. The gospel. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again according to the scriptures. Now, if words mean anything, and you can believe them, that says right there that the, Paul, that the gospel Paul preaches will save you. Does it not? That gospel will save you. Now, these folks, as I was talking about it, but the, the market come along and said, well, no, you've you you know, you got to go back to Matthew 28, and you've got to go to Matthew, uh, Mark 16, and, and you've got to understand that issue there. You've got to be baptized, and uh, you, you've got to do all this stuff, you know, but you know, that won't work, folks. And why won't it work? Why won't Mark 16, 15, 16 work? Because it tells you that you need to be water baptized to be saved. But it also says if you are and you believe that you can drink poison and it won't kill you. You can take up a rattlesnake and he can bite you. It won't bother you. Everybody I've ever challenged to do that they won't do it. I, I, yeah, I believe that. I believe that's what you got to do, and I believe that's what will happen. That's the power of God. But they won't drink the poison. Their faith fails them, doesn't it? The gospel today is a gospel that gives us that wonderful good news, and it's the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That perfect Lamb of God that was a sacrifice on that cross for our sins. And folks, it was a perfect sacrifice. When Jesus Christ accepted that sacrifice of his sin, son, he was perpetuated. He was satisfied. That's all he needed. Now, if you think that what Paul's telling you here and what's preached in the four Gospels is all the same thing. There's a couple of verses of Scripture you're going to have a little problem with. Come back, come back to Matthew chapter 16. Let me give you two chapters to look at. Luke chapter 18, Matthew chapter 16. Now, I know you're probably familiar with these, but it won't hurt you to look at them again. Keep them in memory. Remember, that's what Paul says, do keep in memory. Matthew chapter 16. And Luke chapter 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, 
This shall not be unto thee. Why did Peter say that? If the gospel is that Jesus Christ was going to die for you and be resurrected on the third day, why wasn't he preaching that? And why didn't he know that when the Lord told him this? You know what the answer is? Peter didn't know that. He did not know the gospel that Paul preaches. He didn't know that Jesus Christ was going to die on that cross and shed his blood for the sins of the world. He knew that there was a coming redeemer that was going to die for the nation of Israel, be that perfect sacrifice. But that clearly says when the Lord told them that he was going to die on the cross, no, Lord, that ain't going to happen. Now, that's a direct contradiction of what Paul's gospel is. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 and verse uh, 31. Same setting, but just a different wording of what was said. Starting in verse 31, Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And notice their answer. They understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them. Neither knew the things which were spoken. How many times do you have to say it that they don't understand something? Can you understand something you've never been told? No. Because it was a mystery. God had it hid before the foundation of the world. He never declared it back there in the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament was looking forward to the coming of the kingdom on this earth for the nation of Israel. The fact that they were going to be set aside and God was going to deal with somebody else. He was going to deal with all the Gentiles and the Jews on the basis of one in the body of Christ because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. Then when Peter and them was preaching, was belief in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection necessary for the kingdom gospel? No. They didn't know it wasn't necessary. Is it necessary for you and I today? Yes. Yes. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning is the most wonderful news you could ever hear. That secret, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul talks about it here. The writer is Luke, but it's the words of Paul. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Paul here makes this statement. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. The purpose of that death on that cross was to be able for God to pour out his grace with no law, no requirements on your part, he took away all your sins. He put them on his son. And he laid them out there. He poured out judgment on his son on that cross. But he never told anybody that until he revealed this to Paul. So when Paul says Christ struck him down on the Damascus Road and to reveal his son in me. It was a secret. It was something new. If it wasn't, why did he have to reveal his son? Saul was a high-ranking Pharisee, a rabbinical scholar. He knew about Christ, and he knew about the Old Testament scriptures. He knew about the law. He had that down. But Christ had something 
No one else knew. It was a total secret. No one knew. And when I say no one knew, not even Satan knew it. You know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, if Satan would have known that Jesus Christ was going to die on that cross to save you and I by his grace, would he have crucified him? No. He sure wouldn't have. He sure wouldn't have. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery." even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. The princes of this world, that's Satan and his cohorts, they did not know what Christ was going to accomplish on that cross. But they thought they had got the victory when they killed him. Much to their dismay, God today says he's in, he, he, he's in a mess it founds out now that he actually helped God do the very thing he needed to do to save you and I. How do you think Satan felt about that? Mad, mad, mad. Paul's gospel explains a lot of things to us that you won't find anyplace else in the Bible. And when you're studying the Bible, if you take Paul's gospel, Romans to Philemon, and you can mix it up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Acts in the Old Testament, you're going to have confusion. You're not going to know what the body of Christ is. You're not going to know what the gospel is. You're just going to have confusion. Paul's gospel explains that resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that no one else said anything about. It explains why he was resurrected from the dead to save you and I by his grace. We are called by Paul to get our good news. People say they were called by God to do so and so. The, the, the thing that calls you to do anything today is, is Paul's gospel. You know that? Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I know most of you need to know this passage of scripture, but let's look at it again for a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Paul says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. God's wonderful grace is only demonstrated and shown to us in Paul's writings. Now, why do we make so much of the mystery in Paul's message? Because it's your message today. It's what God is saying to you today. It's not what God is saying to Israel. When we're gone and the church is raptured up into heaven and Christ comes back to set up his kingdom here, it's going to be a time, as we mentioned last week, a time of terror when the tribes of the earth are going to flee and hide from God. It's not a good time. But we won't be here. We'll already be up in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25, I want you to put this, 
verse down if you don't have it. And remember, because sometimes you'll think about this thing, the mystery, and you'll want to read something to somebody, and you'll read this, these two verses to them. Nine times out of ten, they'll say, I never saw that before. But notice what it says, Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. That gospel that Paul preaches, he says here, is a gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ that will establish you. Now, you know what establish means. Establish is a process of getting established. Established is grounded. You got it. The gospel that Paul preaches will do that for you. But in closing, there is... Another term that Paul uses for our salvation that I think is really great. A couple of verses. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. No, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll skip that one. 1 Timothy 1, 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be Look at that word, glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. The glory of God magnified, made wonderful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, he calls it this. Second Corinthians chapter 4. And verse 4. Well, do 3 and 4 through 6. 3 through 6. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. To whom, in whom, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them for we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servant for Jesus sake for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ notice the terms that he uses there in verse, verse 4 the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. There's a glory of Christ, there's a gospel, but there is a glorious gospel of Christ. Paul calls it the mystery. I hope and pray you know what this is, and if you don't, then spend some time reading some verses, and if you don't understand some of these things, let us know. We have a lot of booklets and things available for you, and most of them we'll make do you for free but the most important thing we want you to know is that you can be established in the Lord you can be happy you can be satisfied the issue of fear some people today are, are scared to death of the rapture because they don't know what's going to happen when they stand before the Lord are you afraid to die and go up there I hope not you shouldn't be there is no fear God has taken care of everything that's wrong with us. He put it on his son on that cross. 
and he paid for it, poured out his wrath so that you can rest eternally and be happy. You know, a lot of people go to church and they're, they're not happy because they don't really get the answer to what they need. They're always wondering why there's something that they didn't get. Well, when you rightly divide the word of God, it'll all begin to fall into place and you can rejoice. Paul says rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for our great salvation. We thank you for this gospel message you've revealed to the Apostle Paul about you. Concerning your son, all that he did for us, he did it all so he might display his marvelous, wonderful grace in saving us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. Thank you for the folks that are with us this morning, for our visitors. We pray, Lord, that they will receive a blessing from being here, and uh, we know that they're a blessing to us. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, for we ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake we pray. Amen.